Tem gurile gai. A reti angi wana. Reti masi ane politikali incorrect. Let me ask you about what happened today, and then I want, I'm going to ask you about something that I, I'll pack for now. So, uh, Tabumbeki uses these platforms, and of course, those who accuse him, they say to speak against the ANC, of which I don't agree. He enjoys speaking to people directly. So, there's a question that was asked by Dr. Nkuna. He asked him, what is the the difference, no, no, he said when he was writing his paper, he said the difference between the foreign policy of Tabu, no, no, of Ramaphosa and Zuma, it's what he wrote about. There's a distinction and it brings me back to those nine wasted years. Such things, how do you attribute something when the ANC keeps telling us they do something as a collective and even government, they speak about a collective. Where do you draw distinction when, whenever such things are brought to the fore, to an individual president, and when do you say this is a uh, this is a collective decision? Please also allow uh, remind them who are you and where you're from, and then you can answer. Thank you. No, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Luko Namguni, acting executive director at the Ravonia Circle, and uh, of course uh, do public political commentary. Um, I think you know, yes, political parties will always have you know a framework because foreign policy decisions on the day-to-day -day for any president are guided by the evolving dynamics of geopolitics and events that happen around the globe. So parties take a framework, so you have a framework stance on Palestine, for example, on the people of the Western Sahara, uh, your outlook on the balance of forces globally in terms of the East and the West, are we shifting towards a multipolar world, or are we shifting towards uh, still a consolidation of the unipolar world? So that analysis becomes important. But when events, you know, arise, <clears throat> and I, I'll make an easy example because it also came up here, the issue around the African Renaissance. You will know that when former President Mbegi was uh, president, he was very passionate about the digitization of the Timbuktu manuscripts. When the Zuma administration came, because that budget allocation for the South African government was with the Department of Arts, Sports and Culture, when the Zuma administration came, it reduced that budget and it eventually removed that project from, from happening. Now, then it tells you that where the focus was. And the focus of the Zuma administration was really about the integration of South Africa into BRICS. Because remember, when he comes into power in 2009, South Africa is not yet a member of, of BRICS. It's knocking, there was IPSA at the time, India, Brazil, South Africa, and so on. And, and therefore, I mean, I characterized foreign policy under uh, former President Jacob Zuma as a polygamous foreign policy that, you know, sort of took after himself in some ways. Uh, because whilst he was preoccupied with BRICS, he was also trying to foster a very positive relationship with former president of the U.S., Barack Obama, signing a number of, you know, anti-government uh, corruption and, and accountability issues and so on, and really moving. And then, of course, we hit a snag with the issue of the International Criminal Court, uh, with, uh, you know, the, te the, the possible arrest of Kenyatta. Uh, for the uh, violence in uh, Kenya, uh, post-election violence. And the African heads of state met in an extraordinary summit. It was about 2013, if I'm not mistaken. And there was this issue that uh, there should be no prosecution of sitting heads of state. And eventually, there was agitation that South Africa should leave uh, the ICC. Of course, President Ramaphosa came in and halted that. It's been quite difficult to read where... Who's, uh, who are Ramaphosa's friends in, in some ways, uh, very close to the Ethiopian Prime Minister, uh, close to President Macron of France, and uh, not too clear what his relationship is like with the U.S., whereas, I mean, with former President Habombegi, uh, they tried to win a number of things uh, as, the, as the trio, uh, you know, the Senegalese president, a, a South African president, Nigerian president at that time when they were moving for the formation of the AU, NEPAD, and so on. So I'm trying to say foreign policy also mirrors the passion that an individual president has and what is their commitment, what is their outlook. Uh, as you heard today, I mean, uh, he spent some time uh, recounting uh, times when South Africa intervened in peacekeeping, in uh, conflict resolution. And President Ramaphosa tried with the African heads of state delegation to Russia and Ukraine. But nothing has really shifted uh, following that trip. What is the next step? What, is, what needs to happen? And so South Africa has sort of retreated in playing quite an active role in conflict resolution in multilateral uh, institutions of course uh, people will disagree here and there but uh, all i'm saying is that uh, if there's one area where i think the character 
the passion and personality of a president shines, it is really around the question of foreign policy, because all that the party gives you is a framework under which to box. So, <clears throat> let me go directly to uh, maybe attaching a, to uh, maybe a, uh, maybe an event to a president, because like I said in the beginning, for me, who's not a political analyst, it's very difficult to say this is ANC, this is government, and this is an individual president. So, I can't remember if it's resolution 1963, where the no-fly zone was done, and I remember Zuma was the one who was apportioned blame for having uh, this security thing, and then, and he was the blood of uh, the blood of uh, Muhammad Gaddafi was in his hand, literally, and we, we could not know. And such things, do you? Uh, and in, unfortunately, it was Floyd who said uh, who said something very funny in a stage, and Mshuluzi replied, "It's Utin Baba," and it, it, things soured. But now they are dilly dally; they are they are they are lovers now. So, such thing, is it government? who participated there? Is it Jacob Zuma's policy? Is it, what is it? So I just want to know, because you understand that I'm always t talking to the nine wasted years, because I don't believe those were nine wasted years. If they are nine wasted years, then it has to be all of government and it has to be all of ANC who would have wasted those years, not to So it, it's exactly what I'm talking about. There's a framework you are operating under. How do you deal with conflict in the continent? What is the place of the AU and so on? Then there are daily events. So the United Nations Security Council sits and takes a vote. And in fact, I think South Africa, and including former President Jacob Zuma, has not accounted enough to the country as to why South Africa in the Security Council voted for the no-fly zone. Because Germany abstained in that vote. China, which has a veto power, abstained in that vote. So what was the urgency for South Africa, and I think at the time, Chad, if I'm not mistaken, but another African country, a West African country, voted. And Mugabe went to the AU and berated them for having done something of that nature to say, why would you vote for something like this? And then, of course, seeing that, you know, this will put South Africa in a tricky position in the continent, former President Zuma then tries and asks for a suspension of the no-fly zone so that he can go into Libya and have a conversation with a former president, Gaddafi. That's an event. It can't be an ANC policy thing because the ANC didn't sit to take a resolution on that. Somebody communicated between the Ministry of International Relations and Cooperation and the president and the ambassador for South Africa to the United Nations Security Council to give them a mandate because that ambassador would not have voted without a mandate from government. That was definitely government action. Then we need to ask what was motivating government action or was there a lack of appreciation and understanding what a no-fly zone means and what it could necessarily result into in terms of airspace control, in terms of pressure, you know, and, and in terms of the opportunity it would open for those who have for years stood opposed to the leadership of Gaddafi, because it was quite known that there were people who would have been very keen to assassinate him, kill him, for years since he came into power via a bloodless coup. So that, that, that's where you can create a separation. So that's why I'm saying the events mirror sometimes the sensibilities of the government of the day. And that government of the day, unfortunately, on matters of that seriousness, uh, you're not going to say in the US who pulled the pin on the, on the, on the nuke um, you know, on the, on, on the nuclear power. It's only the president who can, so, so that would be a presidential act. So we've got to get to a point as well, <clears throat> not to be confused by politicians, what they tell us about collective responsibility and so on, understand how decisions flow and once the decisions have, 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 have been taken, how they are communicated. And that's, and that's a classic example where you can, separ you can create that separation and actually try and hold some people accountable. Last one about today. Mbeki spoke about uh, declassification of, of, of report, especially the one that started the xenophobic. I think that was quite uh, impressive of him uh, he, because he was painting a very good narrative. And we have seen in the past that government would even have stories that would assist us in the, in the populace to give us an idea of what is happening, but they keep it close to the chest. And with this GNU, you would see a new minister just comes and tells us something that is not new, something he, but he just drops it expose and so I want, I want to say to you are there things that you think 
government communication is failing and it is some it, it, it is damaging the, the efficiency of the ANC because they keep a lot of things hidden and of course some for some part they are protecting each other about that well, that's why some of us in 2011, as far back as 2011, we fought the Poppy Act, uh, not the Poppy Act, the, the Paya Act. Uh, no, man, I'm, I'm making mistakes here. The secrecy bill, which was uh, meant to be about uh, promotion of access to state information. No, no, no. That, that's a different one. Anyway, let me explain what the secrecy bill was. I'm forgetting what the official name was. The secrecy bill was about who has the rights to classify and declassify. It was even giving rights right down to municipal level on the classification of documents. And then it was giving a prison sentence to journalists who reported on classified documents without an option of a fine and without an option of presentation and without an option of the public interest in that particular uh, 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 That's why when President Ramaphosa comes into office in 2018, he sends that bill back to parliament. And that's because <coughs> that, that bill, uh, yes, the POSI bill, promotion of state information, protection of state information, that's what it was called. That POSI bill has been in the working for 11 years. It's not going to pass because we will continue to resist it in society because we must get to a point where government understands that most of its actions should be as transparent as possible. What you classify should be matters that have to do with you know, national security and all of that. But you can't have a situation like the minister of, or the former minister of higher education did, classify the national, get a committee in parliament to classify the National Skills Fund forensic investigation report. Because then when you keep too much information, you allow for corruption, inefficiency, and poor governance. And he was quite correct. And I thought actually it's interesting because I haven't heard from President Mbeki speak on this issue of 2008 in a very, very long time. Because he was out of the country when the chaos erupted in Alex, and then he had to come back into the country. Now, that we now know that there is that report. It would be interesting... Uh, what the, the current president will say when we write him a letter to say, can he declassify that report so that uh, we, can, we, we can probably start f tracing the, the truth of and test the assumptions that would be in that report. Because remember, just because something is an intelligence report does not necessarily itself mean that it may not have shortcomings. I mean, we've seen ministers being removed on bogus intelligence reports in this country. Thank you. So the last two questions. The last one is... President Zuma has f quite recently told people that come and unite. Floyd has said the same thing. People who are going to MK keep saying this thing. Guys, yes, a part for all African people. Let's come and unite. A lot of us who are very skeptic, we find it as disingenuous. Uh, Malema left ANC and said, come, let's make one thing. You know, this broad church thing. Why do people open their thing and then they say, come here? Why don't they go to something that someone has opened? Uh, you could say Kenny Kunen is the same thing because he came from, from EFF. Will we ever find a unity of African parties uh, based on the fact that everyone wants to open their, their own shop and say, come to mine? They don't call them African parties. They call them black parties. And I've asked, what are black parties? I, 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 I'm, I'm still really, really in search of what do people mean when they say black parties should unite? What is a black party? <clears throat> I, 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 in the current you know, psyche and democratic architecture of what we have tried to do in South Africa, I am not convinced that... Um, well, I, I suppose you can exist and call yourself a black party if that's what you want to exist for. But you'll remember that uh, Black First Land First had to amend their constitution for them to be accepted by the IEC as a political party. Because the, the, the dispensation that we have is one that political parties are voluntary associations. They must be open to all South Africans so that all South Africans can exercise their right to affiliate. And that's why EFF has uh, white, white, white uh, members. So when they then call themselves a black party, it's one thing to say you are a party that has a, a clear bias to fight for black people's emancipation in society because they are being left so far behind in terms of development. In fact, their outcomes are being stunted and, and there's regression. That's a different issue than saying you are a black party uh, because... <clears throat> You, you, you have to be aspirational in your, in your, in your existence. And, and therefore, if you call yourself a black party and only for black people, unfortunately, in this country, you will not be able to register that political party if that is in your constitution. Because we're not trying to build a black state. We, we, we are trying to build a South Africa where there is development for everybody, where there is 
uh, success for everybody and that it does not matter where you are born. And that's simply because as a foundation of this democracy, a decision was taken that everybody will belong to South Africa. Now, if people then say that was a wrong decision, then they must then tell us, um, do you want us then to drive certain populations uh, out of the country, which in other countries these things happen. But I'm saying in this current dispensation, that's not the country we are building. So I'm really curious when people talk about black parties. Maybe if they're talking about African parties, it'd be different because they're talking about something much more expansive. Because I also think the usage of black is in crude terms. It's not even within the ambits of the black consciousness framing of who are the black people of South Africa within the context of, subjug of subjugation, colonialism, and apartheid. Here you've got a narrow a formulation of black, which is to organize black people. And of course, it's because of the direction of our politics. Is a patriotic alliance is organizing around a, a colored nationalism of sorts. Uh, you've got uh, others uh, like, uh, you know, uh, Hanif Hendricks of uh, Al Jama. They, they want some uh, Sharia law. Uh, they're organizing around that. So that, that's where some of our politics is going. The question is whether citizens are, are going to allow themselves to be divided in that way um, or they are going to allow themselves to search once for, for an engine that may give nation building a chance. Thank you very much. Here's a phrase that was a, 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 <clears throat> a portion to you. And I want to ask you, this one is for the audience. Amasela, who are those people? No, Bantu Olomisa actually popularized this thing. <laughs> he, he, he spoke about Amasela and he was pointing to the ANC benches in parliament. I just simply used it in radio. In actual fact, Amasela are people who steal from our public press. That's why when the issue that happened of a delegation of leadership from Zululand district, an IFP-led municipality, whom the then mayor is now the MEC for Cocta and KZN, uh, they went to Deben for a stretch session and, and spent a lot of money. I spoke about that issue on radio. After the show, I had a text from him. He said he'll send me invoices and things to prove that there was no corruption. I never received any of those things from him. So Amasela are people who steal from the press. And unfortunately, I never mentioned anybody's name besides probably some basic things. I mean, I went after digital vibes when I was on air because I think it was gross to steal during COVID. Money that was meant you know, to be life-saving and, and, and so on. But... The point about Amasela are those people who steal from the public purse. It's just that I think the shoe f was fitting too much for some people, and then they started thinking I'm talking about them. So is it true that the ANC put a lot of pressure because they thought Amasela, you are referring to them? No, I'm sure the ANC might have put some pressure, but I mean, the working relationship and dynamics deteriorated. Um, and I have no doubt that there, there may have been some pressure. Um, coming from, from various quarters. Because remember, if you watch my Twitter feed, uh, today I'm called an EFF, that day I'm called a sellout, a liber a liberal, DA, Oppenheimer, George Soros, that day I'm called an ANC fixer. I'm a so, media practitioner, I receive those things as well. Exactly. So you never know when you are fighting shadows where exactly the pressure is coming from. But definitely there was no doubt that there were some shadows that I was fighting. I appreciate the content the knowledge that you give, similar to JJ, no holds but uh, you push and thank you very much for doing what you're doing, keep doing it. No, thank you and I think uh, it would be nice if many more of us could find our voices, find the strength to use our voices and the courage of our conviction because then at least it would eliminate the possibility of people being easily victimized. People, thank you. You think there's a space for uh, unorthodox uh, media practitioners like you and JJ? In this current context in South Africa, at least in broadcast, uh, I, I don't think there's enough space for them to last. There's no longevity. Thank you very much. Thank you.